The following is a presentation of Project Independence and WCWP. Project Independence is the Aging in Place initiative of the Town of North Hempstead. We provide programs and services designed to assist and support the older town residents who wish to remain in their homes as they age. If we don't currently provide a service, we will try and connect you to that service. Call 311 or 869-6311 to get more information or receive services. Welcome to Project Independence and you. Welcome to Senior Talk Radio here on 88.1 FM and WCWP.org. This is Project Independence and You. I'm your host, John Ryan, and my co-host today is Otto Los. John, great being with you. Always look forward to it. And it's going to be a wonderful show today because we have with us the Nassau County, uh, County Executive, excuse me, Laura Curran. And Laura is not only the first woman elected as county executive, she is a spectacular government official who is going through the pandemic. So not only is she in office for the first time, this is her first term, she is also going through one of the most difficult times in history. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to bring to you at this point in time, Laura Curran. It's so nice to see you. I wish that we could see each other in person. That's always my preferable way, but this is how we're doing things now. And, you know, we'll make it work. Uh, nothing like live radio, right? When, uh, nothing like it, live radio. And, gotta and make it work. Well, we by the way, they've told me that I've got a great face for radio, so I'm really happy to be on the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been having a good time uh, trying to entertain or inform people during the COVID uh, pandemic pandemic but let's start with COVID. Uh, yes this has been the year i don't know the the, the uh challenges just keep on coming so can i just jump in and say hello do you hear me hello, john okay nice okay i'm back i apologize to everybody no it's fine Hi, Laura. i'm fine how are you doing john good doing good and i'm finally back but keep, continue with Otto. Uh, oh the you know what we've learned is that we can continue to keep our hospital rates low we can continue to lower the rate of infection we've been hovering at about one percent of everyone tested testing positive for many weeks now our hospital rates are in the 30s among our 11 hospitals so that's good news because our residents and our businesses have been practicing common sense the face covering the social distancing the you know normal sanitation washing hands we all know that we know that it works and while we see we're recovering but the rest of the country is now spiking. That's the thing that gives me pause. I know we can handle it. My concern is now people coming in from out of state. We're finding a lot of our new cases are people coming in from out of state. A lot of our new cases are young people, graduation parties, that sort of thing. So if we, you know, I'm not one to lecture or hector or tell people what to do, but I just want to applaud everyone for the common sense that they've been practicing, that's gotten us where we are, and just to keep doing it, just keep it going. We have come so far that we don't want to backslide now. Laura, what about, uh, I, I hear in conversation from people uh, some confusion as to whether or not they should really be tested or not tested. Is, is the view that everybody should be tested or only if you feel like you have a problem? What's your stance on that? Oh, that's such a good question. At the beginning, it was only for people with symptoms. There were very strict criteria for who gets tested. People with symptoms, people who've had a known contact. Then it started to open up people who are essential workers or people who think they may have been exposed. Now it's open to everybody. Now, I, you know, if you have no symptoms, no known exposure, I don't think you need to get a test. But if you want to, you certainly can now. Um, we're testing in Nassau County between three and 5,000 people a day. Sometimes it's up to 6,000 people a day. Um, it, you know, if, if you're curious and you want to know if you have the virus, then by all means get tested. Also, there's two kinds of tests. There's the viral test that tells you if you have the infection now. Then there's the antibody test that tells you if you've had it in the past. So a lot of people, now we know a lot of people are asymptomatic. They think, or they think, you know, I had a cold or I lost my sense of smell or I was exhausted a few months ago. Maybe it was COVID. Let me check it out. So bottom line is anyone can get tested. We actually have uh, five community clinics that are open now uh, where you can get both viral and antibody testing. If you don't have insurance, it's not a problem. If you're, if you're concerned about your immigration status, nobody's going to ask. The, the goal is to make sure if you think you're positive, you should get yourself tested so that then we can do the, our health department at Nassau County can do the contact tracing to go through, you know, where do you work? 
Have you been to any events? What about your family? Just to see if there's anyone else who's been possibly exposed, get them tested and isolate them if they're positive. That's how we stop the spread. That's why we've been so successful. Um, so I would say, if you have any doubt whatsoever, go get a test. Well, one of, one of my daughters is a teacher and uh, she's gone through, uh, we're not selling product here, but through a CVS uh, drive-through where you actually can get a test just by driving through. Uh, and um, she's done it because the fact is she is a teacher and has more exposure or possible exposure. Uh, I have had the antibody test, which was negative. So that was good. Uh, but I hear mm -hmm. you. Right. You know, a lot of- Yeah, I had the antibody test, also negative. Yeah. Now, Laura, you took that versus the regular test. Yes, correct. I haven't had the regular test because I haven't had any symptoms. I don't have any known exposure. Okay. So I, I haven't I haven't opted for the actual test yet. So the antibody one would be fine. Actually, and you know, even on listeners at different times, I tell what's going on. Um, that I'm, I'm presently undergoing chemo and different stuff and radiation and yada yada. Yeah. I still haven't had a yeah, test a lot. because they don't they don't ask. They ask the questions every time I go to Sloan. They ask the questions. You know, have you been out of the country? Have you been with anybody, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and unfortunately, the, the temperature wise, I wind up with a, a low grade fever five days a week, but that has nothing mm -hmm. to do. So they, my temperature, they exclude. But you have to know the whole situation. Somebody who has a temperature can't take that chance or a slight fever. You have yeah. to go. You know, mine is a, comes from a different underlying situation. Um, so they exclude it. But if I was the temperature and had somebody from out of state, you know, um, we have somebody coming back from out of state who is, um, worked with us last year in, in the town and is coming back young man, tremendous guy. And he says, we'll be in touch after 14 weeks. I mean, 14 weeks after the 14 days, he's coming home, going into quarantine. He's 28 years old. And, uh, but that's the kid who's using his head. He says, I'm not going to see anybody. And then I'll go out. But you have to, you have to pay attention to those slight little steps um, in order to cover yourself, you know? Yes. You know, I just want to piggyback, before you get into it, Otto, I just want to piggyback on something that John said before. You know, he's been undergoing chemo and he's been, he's been very frank and talking about that. And, you know, obviously he has an immune, uh, compromised immune system because of that. And I'm, I'm just so impressed with how he's doing and uh, he's an amazing man. And it just reminds me, you know, he said to pay attention to the little things and he's so right about that. Uh, you know, there are underlying conditions, things like diabetes, hypertension, obesity, high blood pressure. Uh, if you're used to feeling not well, you might discount some of the symptoms thinking, oh, it's just normal. I normally don't feel so great. But, you know, be in tune with yourself with how you feel. And if, if, if you really don't feel well and you think you could have this, it's so important to get that test and to take well, care of yourself. I would like to add to your uh, commendations on, on John. Uh, he's a hero as far as we're all concerned. And this probably has not been publicly discussed much, but uh, John is paying his dues. And uh, it, it's, it, he's a, quite an example of somebody on how to cope with uh, adversity. And I think that's one of the big things Project Independence tries to promote is to mm -hmm. um, try to function with a positive outlook. And I'd say John is a classic example of a of how to do that. Um, so Amen. anyhow, I believe Amen. I'm unmuted now. Okay, we can now hear you, John. Enough about me. This is about <laughs> Laura. Now I'm unmuted. Maybe that was the universe saying you wanted to talk a minute or two. We, we wanted to talk about you. <laughs> um, I don't know what's going on today. I apologize. Um, I want to skip around a little bit, though, because, um, and this is not a show that is promoting anybody or anything. But uh, Laura has been doing a phenomenal, phenomenal job as our county executive, and she's up for election next year. Um, and I, I think one of the things that I want to touch on in this segment, and we'll go back to, to the COVID, is the promises Laura made and, and kept. 
you know, her, the integrity that has come over this administration is beyond anything anybody's ever seen. She said she was going to put something into effect, and she did, whether it was transparency in the hospital, um, with gifting, with vendors, with um, family relations and stuff like that. Um, I, I honestly think that in the years I've been doing this, uh, there's very few people that have stepped up to the plate, if that's the expression, as honorable and with as much integrity as Laura has, but has maintained it. This was not a show to get elected. This was her truth, and she has proven it. And um, so that was my, my little speech. But at the same time, I wanted to touch on, from, a, from your perspective, how difficult was it putting all those things into effect? You can pick anyone you want. I mean, because I know some of it was an uphill battle. And I know you weren't prepared for this, but we really are going to go all over the place this morning. <laughs> I'm, all, I'm happy to talk about anything. Well, I really want to thank you for your kind words, John. Um, but, we, you know, we know that there has been a lack of trust in government. And that, you know, and the federal level on down to the, to the local level. And it's up to us who are here now to begin to restore that trust. And, you know, it's, it's very simple things that aren't really hard to do, to be honest with you. Um, you know, making sure and signing an executive order very early on in, the, in my administration that people who, are, who work for me, who are involved in the contracting process, cannot accept a gift of any, any value whatsoever, even a cup of coffee from someone seeking to do business with the county or someone who does do business with the county, just to, just to make it very clear to everyone that the person being chosen, the, the company that we're contracting with, they're being chosen because they're the right people for the job, that they're there to do the work. Same with the fact that anyone that I appoint, I have about two, we have an, uh, employees, about 7,200 employees at Nassau County, about 200 of those are people that I appoint. Nobody that I appoint can raise money for any campaign that I do or, or contribute. Again, so that there's no question as to why I've chosen them not so they can help me politically, so that they can be there to do the work of the people. And those were very simple, easy things to put in place. And, um, you know, we remain, I remain as, as vigilant as possible because trust, you, you, not everyone is going to agree with me. I understand that. And that's, that's, that's a beautiful thing about our country. People are free to disagree. Uh, but if there's not that just base underlying feeling of trust, that, my, that what my intentions are, are good, even though they may disagree with what I'm doing or what I'm saying. If, if, if that trust isn't there, then I think it makes it very, very difficult to lead. And it just makes it harder to do the job. And we have really important work to do here in Nassau County. I mean, you think about just to just take the pandemic alone. We're the ones with the health department, with the medical examiner, the morgue, the ambulances, the medics, first responders, the county jail that we had to get ready, you know, all of these things, that's all on the county level. And it's, you need to have that base level of, of support, and um, it's not of support, but of just of trust that people knowing that, okay, I may not like this lady, I don't like what she says, but I, I can think that at least her intentions are good. A hundred, go ahead, Otto. Yeah, uh, the flip side of that is I spent 40 plus years in sales uh, to various governments, uh, to uh, large corporations and whatever. And I never, never liked to deal with a situation where there was that in the air. You knew it was there and, and I never played that game. And I always fought that. And uh, it exists in a lot of places. And uh, the fact is, then you never have a real good relationship with the people you're dealing with. So anyhow, my point is, the flip side of that, if you're credible and you work on trust, it's much better that way than the other way, where you have to worry about paying people off or giving gifts or whatever. Uh, that's, not, uh, that's not a fun way to do business on the other side of the coin, in my opinion. <laughs> Oh, that's a very interesting perspective, Otto. Yeah, you, you, want, you want to be chosen on the merits. Yes, and, you know, and have an honest relationship with the people you're dealing with as opposed to uh, one of uh, devious stuff, you know. Yeah. Nobody's going to be perfect. And actually, this was something I had read years ago. And I, I think, I'm not sure, I believe it was Tom Swazi who used it recently and might have been on the show. But it comes originally from Ed Koch. 
And Ed Koch said, if you uh, agree with me on nine out of the 12 things that I'm pushing for, vote for me. And if you believe with me on 12 out of the 12, you need your head examined. <laughs> That's, That's great. True. I love that. It, it's impossible. <laughs> I'm gonna and I that. agree with everything Laura is doing. But it is possible. And that's, that's going to be with your wife. That's going to be with your best friend. That's any, anything in life. Nobody is in 100% agreement at any given point in time. But you have to be in agreement enough to say, I know we're going in the direction of the dream for the county, and this is the woman who's taken us there. That's it. Will there be you know, along the way? Good. John, I just have to say, that is such, I, I had never heard that before. I'm going to look it up. I'm going to steal that. I yeah, think it's absolutely. Great. Especially now with the political discourse when if you don't march in lockstep with whatever X is saying, uh, if, if there's any nuance or any room for disagreement, then somehow you're, you're dreadful and no one should ever listen to you. But, but that is a very mature way. If, yeah, you're gonna agree with, if you agree with most of what I'm saying, then okay, good. But we're not all going to agree all the time. That's just the nature of human beings. And to try to um, have this sort of litmus test for people. If you don't abide by these, all of these things, then, you know, we're going to, we, we, we don't even want to talk to you. It's, it's just, that's, I, that's a big part of the problem that I'm seeing in our political discourse nationwide. I, I agree. I think the way it sits now, you're either supposed to be all the way over there or all the way over there on the right or the left. There's nothing in the middle. You can think one way about one topic and another way about another topic, and uh, <clears throat> like John said, can't, I, why do you have to agree with everything that somebody says? I don't think you do. And yeah. I, you know, I believe that's a big problem, as you point out, Laura, as far as the political world goes right now. I mm -hmm. don't think that's true here. That's my opinion. You know, I don't, I, it doesn't exist in, in Nassau, but it's very true. And, and today it is that the world, you know, has gotten so black and white that recently since you're home a lot and my partner peter has gotten me into this you put on msnbc and then you flip to fox and then you flip back like it's like it's two different universes talking yeah. about the same thing it's like were we both at the same meeting to walk away right with two different and yet they're going to go to their graves fighting this stuff which is just craziness as opposed yeah. to getting joining together and get something done proper. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And so I, I try to do that too. I try to listen to all the different voices, get all the different perspectives. But it's true. Sometimes it feels like, are we living in two or three different realities here? <laughs> yeah, well, perception is reality. And sometimes perception is like somebody says that that uh, tree is a Volkswagen bus. Uh, yeah, that's what they really believe. I don't know how you change it, but you, it's hard to understand that it really is. But that's why it's an effort of working for as many people as you can. You know, you're mm -hmm. never going to, you know, we're talking about it right now, but it's very true. Uh, you're never going to please them all. It's impossible. But if you can live with yourself at night and say, guess what? I'm doing what I think is the best for the county. And that's all you're supposed to do. You're supposed that's to do right. nothing else in life. And that's the same with your family, with your friends, no matter what it is. If you're there for them, the best way you can be, uh, there, there's nothing else anybody can ask of you at the end of the day. Uh, that's right. That's right. And, and, you know, we're going to go back and forth. And the issue is, you know, when we come to the break, which we're coming to again, we can't talk during the break. So that's why... Laura has to wait now to see what I'm going to surprise her with next. You're listening Ooh, to Sandwich Talk right. Radio yeah, on 88.1 FM and WCWP.org. We'll right back. Welcome back to Senior Talk Radio here on 88.1 FM and WCWP.org. This is Project Independence and You. I'm your host, John Ryan, and my co-host today is Otto Lose. Good morning again, John. And we're having a wonderful, wonderful conversation with our county executive, Laura Curran, um, who has just been unmuted. Okay. And, uh, and I have my unmuting properly now. So we're, we're figuring this out as we go along here this morning, which is fine. Every, every day is a new adventure, which is great. Um, we're going to get back to the last half talking about COVID and, and what's ahead and stuff like that with schools and everything else. Um, but one of the fights that Laura has had and has really, it's been an uphill battle, um, but she's winning, is uh, property assessment. 
um, which is, it's, again, this is one of those things, there is no perfect answer. Uh, at one point in time, um, you got to pay the fiddler, whatever that expression is, and we've come to that point. And, and you know, um, taking a phrase from Judy Bosworth um, at the installation in January, uh, I know Judy acknowledged that Laura was not kicking it down the road. Um, she had handled it, you know, head on, got into office, um, and she's dealing with it. And if you could give us an update, um, just, you know, to review it. <laughs> Honest with you. I have conversations sure. with people and they don't know it. And guess what? I'm not the person to give them any advice. <laughs> well, it's very complicated. But the bottom line is uh, our assessment system has been a mess. Uh, and I won't bore everyone with, with why that is, but it, you know, I'll just give you one, one reason why. Uh, it's, it's, we're one of the only two counties in the entire state where it's the county that, does the, that sets the assessment. There's another small upstate, I think it's 100,000 people live there. Uh, there there's, so there's that county that does it, and then we do it. And then on top of that, the county then, if there is a grievance that is won, the county then has to pay back, not just the county's share of the dollars, the tax dollars, but the school districts and the special districts. And it gets, uh, anyway, the whole bottom line of this is that the county is hundreds of millions of dollars in debt because of this crazy system that we have. Uh, and then layered on top of that, that the assessment system had, you know, the assessments had become wildly inaccurate over the previous administration, wildly inaccurate and widely unfair. So, you, you know, we know that taxes are very high here in Nassau County, but at least everyone should be paying their fair share. You shouldn't have some who are overpaying to make up for those who are overpaying. So I campaigned on a promise to once and for all fix this. And I knew that it wouldn't be easy. I knew that I had to do it early because it, the, the longer you wait, the worse it gets and the harder and more expensive it gets to fix. So got in and did a, the first reassessment in the better part of a decade and uh so now you know we're in the process now we're in the grievance process now but with courts being closed that it get that has gotten much more complicated the pandemic crisis has made the has made that more difficult for us but what we're handling it uh the thing about doing a reassessment when property taxes are so high you could have the best system or the worst system i think you know we actually are finally on the road to fairness and accuracy which is what people deserve but Whenever you do anything with assessment, it's a very difficult issue because it just reminds everyone that our taxes are very high here. Whether, you know, and I get, I, I do get a little bit defensive because I, I tell people, look, for my own property tax bill, and this is pretty normal, 15, 1,5% of the property taxes that I'm paying are actually going to the county. 70% is going to my school district, and I have kids in the school. I'm a happy customer. I think it's a wonderful district, but it's 70, 70%. The rest of the town, um, I don't have a village, special districts, and all of that sort of thing. So that is just the reality that we're in. We have 300 independent taxing jurisdictions here in Nassau County, 300 governments. That's a reason, a big part of the reason why our taxes are so high. So this is the system that we have. Our job at the county is to get the assessments as accurate as we possibly can. And I believe we are finally on the road to getting that done. Wow. I have a question based on the fact that I don't know enough about this, but it probably would be on a lot of other people's minds. Yeah. 300 special districts. Would anybody think about merging some of these together in, in ways that, uh, yeah, I know it will never happen with schools. There's a lot of school districts. Most people really don't want their district merged with another district. Um, but is there anything that can be done at all in terms of trying to uh, put some of these special districts together to cut down on overhead and, and uh, cost of doing business, if you will? Well, that's a very logical question, and it's one that comes up all the time. So anytime you want to either dissolve or merge a district or dissolve one district into another, you have to have a public vote on it, a public referendum. And there have been a few of these over the years. I know down where I live on the South Shore, there was a resolution in 2012 
to disband the sanitation district. And, you know, the thought was to have, perhaps have it just be part of the town of Hempstead, have them take it over. It was soundly defeated. Uh, I think six times, or, or, or it was like a huge amount came out to vote for this, much more than vote in the school district, the school budget, which is a lot more tax dollars at stake. Out in Suffolk County, there was a plan uh, on the referendum, there was a two referenda to merge two school districts. Twice it failed at the polls. So often when there is a vote for this, people, while they don't like the high taxes, they seem to like that local control. So my, my, if anyone says, well, why don't you just merge the districts? So I would tell, I would say that has to come from the grassroots because it's the people that actually vote on such a thing. It's the people who have the say whether they want these special districts or not. Right. And I, my opinion is what you said. I think most people won't want to give up the special districts. So it's yeah. probably uh, logically a good idea. Had Long Island just started today and it was a flat piece of ground, um, we could have done it differently, but that's not how it happened. Uh, you are so right. You're so right. Like if, if we could build a time machine and, and plan this, I think we would have done it much more logically. But it was, but think about how we were settled. People like came out from wherever and they said, okay, we want a village. We want a hamlet. We want our own fire department. Hey, let's have a school district. Um, we need a sanitation. So it was sort of a hodgepodge settling. It wasn't, it wasn't very, it was not very consciously planned. Right. And that's just the way it is. The, the interesting thing that's is, the way it is. Yeah, I agree with you there. But the, the, the more interesting thing is, and Otto kind of said, well, both of you are saying it. Everybody wants change, but nobody wants to accept it from their perspective. Uh, and, and it really is a shame because, you know, we'll all have this esoteric argument or discussion about how the world would be better. But give me the first person that's going to give up something. Right. Walk away. And it's like, and it's going to be Laura's fault or it's going to be the legislation's fault. It's, going to, it's, somebody, it's not their fault. Right. Then give, what do you want? You can't have it both ways. They want the other person to give it up, which is, unfortunately, it's human nature. And another reason we have to deal with, not we, but at the county level, you have to deal with all this stuff. Everybody mm -hmm. wants it. It's the most amazing thing. But, they, you know, do your chores and we'll give you an allowance to buy whatever you want this weekend. They want the allowance, but they don't want to do the chores. <laughs> right. That's, they, 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 they should be treated like children because that's the way the world exists at this point in time. But it's something that we are, we, you are moving along on. Um, and and I, I didn't even pay attention to the fact that all the courts being so messed up. Yeah. That, that's, oh, yeah. It's challenging and everything going on right now with the courts being so messed up it's just pathetic um that i forget who i was talking to recently um one of the judges and like some of the and which you would know some of the cases are actually they've gone into the the jails in order to have some sort of trials going on i mean every, everything just can't be put on hold you know it's yeah. for where we are but you have to move forward um, going to moving forward a little pandemically, uh, back to where we are with that. Uh, I think that's the first time that's been used as an adverb, pandemically. I like it. <laughs> I just make things up as I go along. When I get home, my wife will turn around and say, where do you come up with this stuff? <laughs> um, is it a word? It is now. Oh, okay. It is now. <laughs> You've heard it first on 88.1 FM. And since Laura heard it and is going along with it, it's definitely a word. Um, mm -hmm. But pandemically, what would you say are things, I mean, we're gonna be here for a while. In my opinion, the earliest, and maybe I'm terrible to say this, is gonna be spring of next year. I mean, we need a vaccine for people to be comfortable. Uh, going back to school, you know, I'm involved with the Children Learning After School program in Great Neck. And we had a meeting yesterday. It's nightmarish bringing mm. kids back to school. Uh, it's going to be one, not one, it'll be two days. Some will get three days. How does a woman, and that's a terrible thing to say, but nine out of 10 times, the man says, I'm going back to work. And the woman has to figure out how she goes back to work because the responsibility that the kids is hers. How do they do it? I don't know what's going to happen. And I'm not putting that answer on you, Laura, but it's like, it's such confusion at this point in time. Um, you know, I have to say, I really feel for our school superintendents and principals right now because there's so much uncertainty. So they're asked to be, to be putting together these plans 
with all of the moving parts that they have to deal with, cafeteria, school bus, kindergartners, vulnerable teachers, schedules, it's really, it's a, it's a house of cards as it is without, right. the, without COVID on top of it. So I've been actually speaking with them, um, regular Zoom calls with superintendents and other school leaders, education leaders. So they have to put together these plans, but yet, you know, while we're waiting for the state any minute now to say whether or not they can open. So they, they don't even know if they're gonna be able to implement these plans that they're putting together or if they'll have to reshuffle the whole deck and put it together a different way. So I, you know, I still have two little ones. I have three, two are still in school um, and they go to public school. And you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. I, for my own personal opinion is that kids need to be in school. They need it for their education. They need it for their social development. It's not good. I, I, I know I probably sound like a bit of a nag at home, probably more than a bit, but you know, they're on their phones oh. all the time. That's not, it's not good for their, for their mental development, their social development. So, uh, you know, we're, my district I know is looking at a hybrid model. A lot of schools are looking at a hybrid model, but that comes back to your question, John. How do we handle getting back to work? If you work in a grocery store, you can't remote work. You can't, yeah, and you have little kids who are starting kindergarten. How do you handle that? It's a, it's a real challenge. The list is endless. This is, in my lifetime, by far the biggest impact ever. World War II, all the wars, Sandy, 9-11, as tragic as all these things were. This is like a, everything is affected. There's nothing yeah. on, that's not touched um, and, and seriously impacted. Not, not, people are going to go out of business. There's all kinds of problems. Oh, we're having a wonderful time with our county executive, Laura Curran, who is uh, honestly sharing with us all, all the important things that people want to hear about that's going on. And, and when I said honestly, I didn't mean, I mean, she's being honest in her sharings, which is very, very important. Um, what I'd like to touch upon now is, and there's no answer for this one, but again, some ideas and what people are going through is businesses. Businesses are hurting businesses. You know, uh, there's a coffee shop in the city that, uh, last week when I was in there uh, at 68th street, finally went out of business and they had a big sign. We tried our best, but couldn't. Uh, stay. And it was now I haven't gone in there in months to be very honest with you, made no difference, but they were doing deliveries and doing whatever they tried to keep going. And you know, Manhattan's a different uh, cost level, but what a sign it was, it was heartbreaking. And then this was at Sloan. And when I went in, everybody was talking about it because you know, coffee, you're not making that much on a cup of coffee. So if half the people aren't going in anymore, you're done. Unless you have a huge busy morning, you're done. And, and the same is happening on Long Island, which is going to be a terrible shortfall for us money-wise too. So there's adjustments that have to be made. And I'm not asking you to go into dollar amounts, but people have to be aware. There's a big, in my mind, a big change coming down the road. Oh, John, there is. Uh, I, by the way, just before I get into NASA, I was in NASA in uh, New York City in Manhattan in Midtown at lunchtime right. on Friday. It was bizarre. Things feel kind of normal in the suburbs, uh, but when you go to the city, it, there's hardly anyone around. There are a few lost souls wandering around. But, you know, that's where you really see the stark impact of this virus. So anyway, shifting back a little further to the east here in Nassau County. Um, businesses, you know, like that coffee shop you're talking about in the city, some are just not going to open again. People have lost their jobs. Uh, you know, we're in phase four, which is great. There's no phase five, but guess what? Gyms, catering halls, you know, amusement park type places, all, you know, Adventureland, all of these things can't open. And they, and not only are there, is there no, we don't know when they're going to, you know, not only can't they open, we don't know when they're going to open. So they don't have that clarity. Um, a couple of last two weeks ago, I visited a couple of uh, several gyms and these are independently owned. One is actually in Port Washington. It's called P10 family owned and they have all of the best protocols in place. They are working so hard to make sure they put everything there, the partitions and the sanitizing and spacing things out, moving things around. Uh, so that no one can be close to each other and they just don't know when they're going to open. They've had to furlough their employees. Um, it's really, really tough. And my concern is 
or take a catering hall. They, those big, huge places, they can't open. Think of the property taxes that they pay. We were just talking about property taxes earlier. And, uh, and all the ancillary businesses when you can't have weddings, things like photographers and DJs and musicians and dressmakers and all of these other businesses that are suffering because of that. So we've been doing food distributions. Uh, we've been partnering with Long Island Cares and Long Island Harvest. With Long Island Harvest, we've done oh, well over probably about 15 food distributions. We often have a thousand people coming. People who, who you know, I think about 40% have never gone to a food bank before who now are food insecure. They don't have the paycheck or they have to keep making sure they're paying their rent or whatever it is. So I, I think the, uh, we're going to be feeling this for quite a long time and the recovery is going to be difficult. And now 40%, you know, bringing it to the county, 40% of our revenue comes from sales tax. So we're we're suffering. We're actually doing a big lobbying effort down in D.C. to make sure that the Senate acts. Um, Senator uh, Representative Tom Swazi, who represents uh, the town of North Hempstead, he's been wonderful. I've been speaking with him constantly. Um, he gets it. Now we got to get the Senate to move on this. And I've been speaking with Schumer. I've been speaking with Gillibrand. They're working as hard as they can. But that revenue recovery is incredibly important for the county so we can continue to provide the services for our residents. You know, like we talked about before, if, if we get a second wave of this, uh, we need that health department, we need that medical examiner, we need those ambulances to be able to be working on all cylinders. So that's my focus. So, you know, we are inextricably linked to businesses. Businesses need to survive and to thrive so that people can continue to get their paychecks, so that society can run, and also to help keep the government going as well where we you know you hear that in this together it's really true and that's why i've been advocating at the state level making myself a bit of a nudge with our friends up at the state about how we can reopen safely and i think we've proven that in nassau county the the more we reopen the better our numbers get because we know how to do it our business owners are smart our residents are smart we get it and uh so the push goes on just an example, like, like I bowl and uh, bowling alleys can open. Correct. That's another one. Yeah. W word has it that the bowling alley, one of the bowling alleys near here, probably will not open. So if that bowling alley does not open, it's a huge piece of property. And it's just a small example of the real estate ripple effect that this is going to have, where they're just going to be dead real estate w with basically, what are you going to do with a uh, defunct bowling alley. Uh, somebody's going to have to want to take it and rip it apart or do whatever. And that's just one small example. Yeah. And I know you're well aware. And I agree. I think this is this is a multiple year problem. This is not going to be uh, spring maybe when we can start to function semi normally. But I think the the impact of this thing is going to go on for several years at the least. I, I just think it's a long, I don't want to be negative about it, but I think it's a real world thing that uh, people have to start to deal with mentally that we're, you know, we're, mentally we're going to go through uh, a lot of bad things. And uh, I believe there'll be some mental health issues because of it. I know just this morning I read about um, your involvement with a homeless uh, situation where, where a, uh, a hotel is going to become a place for, uh, homeless uh, people. And I believe that there's going to be, unfortunately, a lot of homeless situations as a result of this whole thing. Um, you know, so that's just one small example. I mean, we could paint a lot of pictures here. All right. You're, I, I agree. I mean, we've, we've, met, we've managed through the surge. Now we're going to have to manage through this economic crisis and a lot of people are going to be hurting. And Otto, you, you touched on mental health. That is a huge issue. When you think about people being isolated, people not sure if they're gonna have a job, young people just starting their careers, we're seeing already, this is raw data, so it, you know, we have to have it doubly, con doubly confirmed, but we're seeing about a 60% increase in fatal overdoses uh, from all drugs, not just opiate, opiates, but all drugs. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're getting the word out that there is help if people are feeling suicidal. Um, domestic violence has been an issue as well. So there's, there's so many issues to deal with. There's the health, there's the economic, and then there's the mental health. And uh, we, we have to make sure that we're getting people the resources that they need. 
we've got a lot of great resources here. The, the key is just to connect the resources to the people. And that's something actually that Project Independence does so well and why I'm such a big fan of this program. That's very true because we are in, in, in every aspect trying to keep people informed, keep them connected. The food insecurity thing, which is, I honestly, I was so shocked in this, in the beginning when I saw these lines of cars, like at Eisenhower Park, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Who would yeah. think in this day and age, but I, I understand it now. And, and the number of people and the trickle, the trickle down is going to be tremendous because you lose a job, but you were helping somebody else and that person's going to get less help, et cetera, et cetera. And from your perspective, even with a budget, I mean, it's hundreds of millions of dollars you're losing. So, you know, you're going to have to really work a budget that's going to be miraculous to keep everything going. You know, we're trying to help our local businesses as, as much as possible. So we're partnering with the IDA to get PPE kits to businesses. And a lot are taking advantage of that, which is great. And it's a help. Uh, we're also working with the IDA to do loans for a lot of the smaller business, a lot of women and minority owned businesses that were passed over from PPP from the federal government, okay. getting them loans to keep them afloat. So we're doing what we can, getting our resources together to help as much as we possibly can. You know, I, I always like to use the phrase, uh, sometimes when my wife and I are sitting there in a recliner watching a show on television, and I say, you know, we're sitting here fat, dumb, and happy, like everything is hunky-dory, right? And the facts of life are, I think everybody has to be a little more aware of, the, of that we're not all fat, dumb, and happy, that there's a lot of bad things going on, and that I believe yep. everybody has to kind of pitch in mentally and try to accept the fact that there are people who need help and, uh, you know, don't uh, have the attitude that uh, I, I did it, you know, so I don't, I don't need to help you kind of thing. I think, uh, I think there's got to be a big shift in attitude uh, as far as a lot of people is concerned. I, I believe they have to face the fact that, yes, this is a tough time and mm -hmm. people do need help and we have to help where we can help. Uh, I think it's a big so social attitude problem, society attitude problem. I think we're more, we're more connected than some people might realize. Yes, agree. And a lot of that in my mind starts at home. I really do believe that. Um, and then with someone like Laura, Laura has taken the <clears throat> home philosophy and brought it to the county executive seat. So it's not a business. It's one huge home of 1.3 million people. And, and she's everybody's mother. Um, but it's the truth. That's the way you have to look. You have to look at it with a caring heart. At the end of the day, it, it has to be a business, but it has to have a caring heart functioning with it. Because, you know, she could just turn around and get rid of half the people who were working for the county. And I'm sure we'd have a very, a much better look at our budget. But you don't do that. It's impossible because then services are ended, people's lives are ruined. You got to just come up working crazily, you know, and I don't envy, you know, Paul Laura, what you're doing. I mean, it's, it's, you know, you didn't plan on this when you took over just to, just to do the regular work. Um, and we're almost out of time. So I'm just stressing this again. Laura took over as the first woman and is doing a tremendous job as County executive, but on top of it, she has been thrown something that no executive in history has ever had to deal with. And she's doing so John, it. I will say I've got a wonderful team and right. we have incredible residents in Nassau County. We've got incredible businesses in Nassau County. I talk to people every day. We, I am so proud of the people who live here and the job that they've been doing. That's what gives me hope that we can recalibrate to whatever the new normal is going to look like. And, and then, get back to our new normal. And we'll, I, I do believe that after, when this, the dust settles, we will be stronger than ever. You know what I like what you just said? Recalibrate. And that's so true because there is a recalibration coming. What it is, I have no idea. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's really going to be with, sent, sent down from you through your people into the town, into the town, into the county. Uh, and it will be a success no matter what you're doing because you've been a success from day one. I want to thank you so much for willing, your willingness to participate this morning. We've been with uh, County Executive Laura Curran. You've been listening to Senior Talk Radio on 88.1 FM and WCWC.org.